What's up guys, I'm Ira Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. Now one of the very last things that Jesus did on the cross before he died was to drink sour wine. This event is so important that it's in all four gospels. Not a single gospel leaves it out. So why is this seemingly insignificant incident so important? Neither Mark nor John even records the birth of Christ, yet they both record Jesus being given sour wine while on the cross. So let's read all four accounts real quick. Matthew chapter 27 verses 45 through 50. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Ele, ele, lima sakbaktani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Mark chapter 15 verses 33 through 38. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Luke chapter 23 verses 32 through 38. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Lastly, John's account. John chapter 19 verse 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Each gospel describes Jesus receiving the sour wine, but only John explains why this takes place. John states that Jesus knew that all was now finished and then asked for sour wine to fulfill the scripture. This now prompts at least two questions. How could Jesus know all things were finished if he still had more scripture to fulfill and what scripture needed to be fulfilled? I believe before we can answer any questions, we need to define wine. In scripture, you have different times when wine is used to represent different things. For instance, in Proverbs 20 verse 1, it says that wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Revelation 16 verse 19 says, The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great, to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Wine represents something different in both of these verses. In Proverbs 20 verse 1, wine represents a stumbling block that mocks those who fall into its trap. In Revelation 19 verse 15, Wine represents the wrath of God Almighty that will be poured out on, specifically in this verse, Babylon the Great or Mystery Babylon. So wine represents a few different things in the Bible, but I don't believe that these verses apply to the sour wine that Jesus was given to drink while on the cross. I believe that Jesus himself tells us exactly what that wine represents. Luke chapter 22 verses 19 through 20. And he took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood.
A couple things I want you to notice is that both the bread and the wine represent different stages of Jesus' crucifixion. He first takes the bread, gives thanks, and then breaks it. Now after he gives them this broken bread, Jesus says that it represents his body that's given for us. Then he took the cup and said that the cup represented the new covenant in his blood. Now both of these things took place at the cross. Look at what Paul proclaimed about the Last Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul tells us that not only does the blood represent the new covenant of Jesus, but it's proclaiming his death until Jesus returns. Why is this important? Well, Romans chapter 6 verse 3 through 11 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he gives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We proclaim Christ's death because in his death we died to sin. And because he raised life again, we will live to him. In other words, we are no longer subject to sin, but sin has now become subject to Christ who lives through us. And since we are no longer subject to sin, when we die, death has no power over us. But instead, to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. So what does this have to do with the sour wine? Well, let's get back to our two questions. How could Jesus know all things were finished if he still had more scripture to fulfill? And what scripture needed to be fulfilled? Well, let's start with the first question. How could Jesus know all things were finished if he still had more scripture to fulfill? As we stated earlier, the night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus said that the cup represented the new covenant. This is important to understand why Jesus said that all things were finished. Jesus wasn't saying all prophecies were finished because he still had more prophecies to fulfill. In fact, there are still some prophecies that have to be fulfilled. Not only prophecies, but feasts as well, which we'll leave for another video for the sake of time. But I say all of this because Jesus wasn't talking about fulfilling every single thing in this one action. Jesus was saying that he knew all things were finished. He sensed something in the spirit. But what did he sense? Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13 says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus spoke of a new covenant for the first time. Before that, Jesus never mentioned a new covenant. Jesus waited to the night before his death to mention the new covenant because it hadn't yet grown old and wasn't yet ready to vanish away. But after speaking of the new covenant and making the old one obsolete and ready to vanish, he went to the cross. Now I want to point out that this is sour wine that Jesus was given on the cross, not wine mixed with gall, which is apparently basically what they used to make poison back in the day because it's like bitter anyway i believe this is very important matthew chapter 27 verses 33 through 35 and when they came to a place called golgotha which means place of a skull 
they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. This is important because before Jesus was crucified, the Roman soldiers tried to give him wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he tasted what it was, he wouldn't drink it. We can't force the covenants of God to change. We can't force the covenants of God to move at our will and our time. This is why Jesus adamantly said these famous words. Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus made it very clear that the law and the prophets weren't being abolished by him, but being fulfilled by him. This is why on the cross, Jesus could make the statements he did. John chapter 19, verse 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus knew that the old covenant had grown old and was ready to pass away or vanish. Not that every prophecy and law were fulfilled. This is why it can say that his next words were to fulfill scripture. So that begs the question, what scripture? Psalm 69 verse 21. They gave me poison for food and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Jesus was fulfilling David's prophecy that they would give Jesus sour wine to drink. Now I want you to understand the importance of this. Jesus sensed in his spirit that all things had been finished. In other words, the old covenant had grown old. So what does he do? He checks. How does he check? By asking for something to drink. And what do they give him? Sour wine. And Jesus, John specifically in verse 30 says that he received the sour wine. I want you to remember what Matthew recorded. Matthew said that the Romans gave him wine mixed with gall to drink, but he refused to drink it. Why? Because you can't cause the covenant of God to be null and void. This is what the Romans were doing without even realizing it. They were taking the old covenant wine and trying to mix it with poison to get, make it go bad faster. But they couldn't. It wasn't until the wine had soured naturally that Jesus accepted it and then he said, it is finished. This is why wine can represent both negative and positive things. Wine is good for you. It's the new covenant that Christ poured out his blood for. But if you misuse that wine, or you make that wine common and you hold it with no regard, then the wine turns to poison to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 32. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Now look at what Paul says about the crucifixion. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 22 through 24. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is how the wine can represent the new covenant as well as a stumbling block or mockery and the wrath of God. How you treat the wine will decide how the wine reacts within you. So just to sum everything up for you guys, the wine represents our covenant with God. 
When Jesus broke bread with his disciples and gave them the cup of wine at the Last Supper, Jesus said that the wine represented the new covenant that was in the blood he poured out. The reason Jesus said that was because he knew that the old covenant was growing old and obsolete, meaning that it would soon vanish. And to make sure we weren't left without a covering, Jesus poured out his blood on the cross so that we would be covered under the new covenant in him and no longer under the old covenant. Galatians chapter 3 verse 23 through 29. There's nothing we can do to force God's hand to change his covenants, which is why Jesus didn't accept the wine mixed with gall. Instead, he waited for the wine to naturally sour or grow old, so that when he had received it, he could say firmly and confidently that it was finished. In doing so, the old covenant vanished and the new covenant has come. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.